I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's okay. Just grab one of the Bibles and the pews around you. They look just like this one. Turn to page 1,231 and you will find 2 Corinthians chapter 9. By the way, if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, then feel free to take one of these with you. Uh, We want you to have the Word of God and read it and let it change your life. Uh, Hey, a couple of things as you're fighting 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, First of all, I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but we have two Saturday night services again. And... uh, at 4.30 and at 6, and uh, there is lots of parking and lots of seating. Same great music, same great children's ministry. I just want you guys to know that because I, I, I grieve over the fact that you have to walk so far to get here uh, on Sunday morning. And, uh, and you're rushing and you're dragging the kids. So just telling you, Saturday night, honestly, we, we would love if about uh, 50 people uh, out of this service moved to Saturday night just until we're in the new building uh, so that we have room for our guests as they're coming back and, and people as they're coming back uh, uh, in the season. So uh, I'm just going to throw that out there and let God speak to you about that. The other thing I get to share with you this morning is this is the first weekend that I get to preach as a grandfather. Yeah. So, I know you're applauding. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, thanks for the, uh, the applause. Actually, I did about 25 years ago, but, uh, you know, that part's long over. Now, uh, Eli Robert Smith was born Friday, seven pounds, four ounces, healthy, and so is mom. And so, we're just praising God and celebrating that uh, this weekend. And thanks for your prayers and your congratulations. Hey, who likes to take risks? Are there risk takers in the room? Okay, some of you raise your hand, a lot of you didn't raise your hand. You know, life involves risk. You really can't escape it. Nothing you can do about it. Uh, It's risk who you marry, you know, Uh, because you don't know. You can make that commitment, you can be 100%, but you don't know if they're going to live up to those vows that they take. Taking a new job. You know, you might think this is a great job, it's going to pay great, and I'm going to love it, and it's a risk. Having kids is a risk. Right? Because you can love them, you can teach them, you can, I'm going to raise them co- correctly, and when they get older, they're going to choose to do what they want to do. Uh, that's a risk. You know what the real risk is? Something that a lot of you are going to do when you leave here today. Eating out. <laughs> right? Because you don't know. You're looking at a piece of paper. It's a fancy piece of paper. You're saying, I want to eat this, and you're not, you don't know who's fixing it or where can any, any of that stuff. Real risk is eating out in a third world country. Now, but the ultimate risk that that almost every one of you engaged in this morning, and and you will in a few minutes, is driving, right? Because you got in an automobile, and you drove here to church, you rode with somebody here to church, and that's risk because you're a great driver, and everybody in this room is a great driver, everybody else out there is nuts, (laughs) right? And you don't know what they're going to do, so it's risky, it's risky. Life involves risk. So I want you to take a moment. I want you to rate yourself kind of as a risk taker. I want you to share this with your neighbor so you don't need to blurt out or anything. Uh, But uh, here's your three choices. Are you kind of a high stakes risk taker? you, you, You like risk. You're okay with that. Or are you a somewhat risky risk taker? Or are you a safe bet? You don't like risk. You avoid it. Ready, set, go. Share that with somebody around you. What kind of a risk taker are you? You know, I I think what happens is I start arguments with that question. Because there's some of you that are like, yeah, I'm really a safe bet. And and your spouse is going, no, you're not. (laughs) Not at all. You are crazy. In fact, last night I had a couple and they were arguing uh, about the question because he's like, I'm a safe bet. I play it safe. And she looks at him just incredulously and she goes, but we own a motorcycle. So today, uh, we're continuing our series, All In. And uh, the question is this, are we ready to take the challenge to accept the risk of following Jesus and his plan for our lives? 
because he didn't say it was going to be easy. And he's going to challenge us, and he's going to lead us. Uh, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church at Corinth. Uh, he's written to them before. This is a church, just quite honestly, is a mess. Paul helped to start the church, and, uh, and now he's uh, writing to them, and he's planning on coming back to them. And it's about a very specific issue at this point, and I'll explain it in just a moment. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has already been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We begin with the story. The story. The Jerusalem church uh, was persecuted and poor. You know, the, the Christianity started in Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and, and the, the disciples led 3,000 people to Jesus. And the church was just blossoming there, and eventually they got persecuted by the religious leaders. And the Apostle Paul, actually, before he became a follower of Christ, persecuted the church. And thousands of Christians left Jerusalem and went all over the Roman Empire. And the church that remained in Jerusalem was just the leaders and a few people who had lost all their lands and their wealth and their jobs, and they were living in poverty. And so Paul, who had been traveling around the Roman Empire, starting churches all over the place, said, hey, I got this idea. I'm going to tell all these churches that are spiritual descendants of the Jerusalem church, hey, we're going to take up an offering, and we're going to take it to them and bless our brothers and sisters in Christ there in Jerusalem. So that's what he's doing. And, and he tells the churches about this, and the Corinthian church, they are excited. Yes, we're going to do this. We're, in fact, we're going to give more than all the other churches. Whatever they give, we're going to give more than them. And so they start talking big, and, and Paul is writing to them now to remind them of what they said. Because this isn't like he shows up one week and he, and he collects it the next week. This is like, you know, months in the planning. And so he writes to him. He says, hey, um, do you guys remember what you said? Because he knew that the Corinthians were people that sometimes their intentions did not equate to actions. Not like us at all. <laughs> right? Because we always follow through with our good intentions. So he writes them and he asks, are you ready? Because I'm going to send... Some people ahead of me, because if I show up with the brothers and you're not ready, it's going to be just really embarrassing for me and humiliating for you. So are you ready? I want you to be ready. I'm asking you the same question today. Are you ready? Are you ready to trust Christ with your life? Some of you have been attending here for a while. Some of you are brand new, and, and you've never made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Are you ready to do that today? Are you ready to be baptized? Some of you know that you're followers of Jesus Christ, but you have never publicly declared your faith in Jesus in baptism. And that's what baptism is. It's your public declaration that Jesus Christ has saved me, has changed my life, and now I am an unashamed follower of his. Are you ready for Jesus to change your life, to, to turn your life around, maybe even to turn it upside down? Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, you know, my life is a mess and I need God to fix it. Are you ready to ask Jesus to change you? Because he will do that. Are you ready to serve? Because maybe God's changed your life and you're in a great place. And you're like praising God and saying, all I am is yours. And God says, I want you to serve. I want you to lead others. I want you to be a part of making my kingdom grow. Are you ready to go all in with Jesus? You see, Paul knew the subject that was holding the Corinthian Christians back from experiencing God's best. And some of us, well, we have the same struggle that the Corinthian Christians had. We like our money a little bit too much. 
Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about money for a little bit, and we're going to talk about giving. Uh, it was a stumbling block for the Christians at Corinth, and it's a stumbling block for some of us as well. Now, before you glaze over, tune me out, start checking your phone for football scores, um, please listen to the principles of biblical giving. Principles of biblical giving. I, I want to share with you three statements that summarize biblical teaching on generosity and, and kind of the philosophy of money and giving here at Calvary. And I, I just want you to hear these three statements before you uh, dismiss what I have to say this morning. Okay? Statement number one, God doesn't need your money. Okay? God doesn't need your money. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God did what? created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. So God made everything that exists out of nothing. So if God can create the universe out of nothing, he doesn't need your money. In fact, the Bible says that everything in the world belongs to God anyway. And so he owns it all. He doesn't need your money. And realize that everything you have, God gave you in the first place. Now, you may say, well, I earned it, I worked hard for it, you know, it was me. But, but understand, he gave you the strength, the talent, the energy, the brains, the wisdom to do all that. So I just want you to understand, God doesn't need your money. And second statement is the church doesn't need your money. Now, some of you kind of like that. Some of you are going, yeah, I keep preaching it. See, the church belongs to Jesus. It's the bride of Christ. And so Jesus loves the church, and so Jesus is going to take care of his bride. Now, he owns everything because he's God, and so he's going to meet the church's needs. He's not going to give the church everything she wants, but he's going to meet the needs. So the church doesn't need your money. Now, we're going to share ministry needs. We're going to share opportunities for you to give and to help. We're going to invite you to be generous and invite you to pray about what God would have you to do. But understand, it's with the understanding that God is the one who provides. Um, now, some of you are going, okay, so if God doesn't need my money and the church doesn't need my money, why are you talking about money? Third statement, we need to give. We need to give. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then these words of the Bible apply directly to you. Look at verse 6 again, because Paul gets really blunt here. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Wow. So, so that means, well, let me just ask you this. Do you want to be loved? <laughs> A couple of you do. Oh, yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> Seriously, do you guys want to be loved? Yes. Okay, then that means that what are we supposed to do to other people? Yes, exactly. Paul is saying, look, you reap what you sow. And so if you, if you sow love to other people, then love's going to come back to you. That's why Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's even why he told us to love our enemies. Because as we love other people, that love comes back into our life. Hey, how many of you like to be forgiven? Okay. Me too. I love to be forgiven because I screw up a lot. And so uh, I like forgiveness, but, but here's the thing. If I want to receive forgiveness, what do I need to do? I need to forgive other people. And, and so as I extend grace and mercy to other people, grace and mercy comes back to me. So I'm going to be the most forgiving person that you meet because I want to be forgiven because I need to be. So do you like to be encouraged? So that means that we should offer what to other people? Encouragement. Encouragement. Yeah, do it if you want to have that, that encouragement in your life. So here's a real tough one. Do you want more blessings in your life? Yes. Okay, then what do we need to do? We need to bless. We need to be generous. You see, the simple truth is we need to give in order to access the blessings that God has for us. If we are stingy, what are we going to get? Yeah, stingy. It doesn't really work grammatically, but I like the idea. 
Yeah, if we're cheap, we're going to get back cheap. If we're selfish, we're going to get back selfish. So we teach and preach and encourage generosity for your benefit. I want you to hear that again. At Calvary, we're going to teach and preach and encourage you to be generous because it benefits your life. And and since I'm your pastor and I want you to grow in faith and I want you to be blessed by God like crazy, I I pray that you'd grasp this truth and let it change your life. Uh, And and since I know that some of us are are visual people and not just verbal people, uh, I want to show you what this looks like. I don't just want to tell you what this looks like. I want to show you what this looks like. So I got an illustration for you. And uh, see if this doesn't make sense. Now, Paul got his idea about if you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly from Jesus. Because in in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Uh, Think about that as I tell this story. Uh, I confess I like ice cream. Okay? Actually, I love ice cream. All right? It is my addiction of choice. It it is my, I I indulge ridiculously. Actually, right now I'm not eating ice cream because I like my pants to fit. But, uh, But I love ice cream. So let's just say that that you know I love ice cream and you invite me over to your house for ice cream. And you actually check with me to find out what kind of flavor I like so that you don't have something disgusting like coffee or something with cherries in it or something like that. And and so I'm all excited. I'm going to come over to your house to have ice cream. And uh, and, But it's your house and you've got weird rules. And you're like, "Um, Pastor Chad, it's BYOB. Bring your own bowl. And... uh, and you can have as much ice cream as you want, but you only get one serving. And I'm like, that's a little weird, but okay. Uh, it's your house. Uh, I'm coming for ice cream. If, if that's the rules and you're inviting me over for ice cream, am I going to show up with a bowl like this? <laughs> Heck no. I, I mean, what's the point? And, and the sad thing is, this is an actual serving size of what you read on the carton. You know all those things you read about how much fat and calories? It's this much ice cream they're talking about. Now, I know there's some of you that go, oh, that's a good deal. To me, this is a sample size. So I'm not going to show up with a bowl like that. I'm not going to show up with a bowl like this. Now, this is cute. My wife loves cute stuff, and so we have a whole worthless collection of cute (laughs) ice cream bowls that look like this. It looks like a waffle cone with chocolate around it, but the problem is you can't eat the bowl. And so... uh, and it doesn't hold enough. The only time we use these are when we have people over as guests and like, oh, she gets to use the cute stuff. I never use it. So uh, I'm not going to bring that bowl. I'm not even going to bring this bowl. This is my normal ice cream type bowl. Uh, and, and you might say, that's all? Well, yeah, but it's four times the size of that one. So, <laughs> you know, I can put enough ice cream in here to kill a village. Uh, but, uh, you know, your rules, you're, you're saying I only get one serving and I got to bring my own bowl. I'm not going to bring that one. No, if, if I got to show up at your house and eat ice cream with your rules, I'm bringing this bowl. I'm like, okay, where's the ice cream? Let's, let's do this. Now, some of you are laughing like, that's not an ice cream bowl. Actually, it is. It was given to me as a gift uh, because I talked about liking ice cream, so I honored the people and ate ice cream out of this. <laughs> Shouldn't have, but I did. Uh, now, let's switch gears from ice cream for a moment. The one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully is going to reap bountifully. Given it shall be given to you, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. Absolutely. And and what's happening in our lives is a lot of us are showing up uh, to God and we're saying, God, bless me, bless my life. And God fills up our bowl, and we're like, God, I want more blessings. This isn't enough. I want more. And God is saying to us, bring a bigger bowl. Bring a bigger bowl. See, God's got the blessings, but you and I decide the bowl. We decide the vessel. And so if we show up and say, God, bless me, he's going to give us all the blessings that we can contain. 
That's it. So if we want more blessings, then we ought to upsize our bowl. You know, if that's the case, if it's blessings and not ice cream, I'm showing up with a 55-gallon drum. <laughs> because that's what I want. I want God's blessings in my life. And so we sit here and we say we want God to bless us more, and we read the principle, and yet we struggle with this. And it's so simple because God lays it out for us, and he says, look, I will bless you however much you want to be blessed. And so God doesn't need our money, and the church doesn't need our money, but we need to give. Because if we want to experience more of God's blessings, then we need to grow in generosity. That's how God has designed this. And, he's, and, he, and the crazy thing is, he's given me and you the, the choice. So, um, hey, let me just ask you this. Do you want this size blessings? Or do you want this size blessings? <laughs> yeah, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? I'm waiting for somebody to go, that looks really huge to me. I don't think I can handle more blessings than that. So wherever you are in this continuum, let me just kind of throw the challenge out to you. Um, if you're given nothing whatsoever and you go, hey, this looks like more blessings than, than I have right now, then, then start here. Start here. Start practicing generosity. And, and if you're here, why don't you move up to here? Or, or if you're here, take a big leap of faith and move up to here. And let God work in your life because he will show up. Now, some of you are, are sitting here going, I, I can't give anything because I am so deep in debt, I'm drowning. If that's the case, if, you're, if your life is just financially out of control, we've got an answer for you. We've got help for you. Starting next Sunday at 11 o'clock, there is a class called Financial Peace University. It's a Dave Ramsey class. Uh, information's in your bulletin about that. You guys are already here at the perfect worship time. You can come to worship and you can go to the class. It costs $100 to take the class. That's for the materials. And it will change your life financially uh, if you are drowning in debt. You don't have a clue how to do this, then, then take the class. Uh, it, it is worth the investment and people are paying off their debt and getting out of that prison of, uh, of just that chokehold of debt. So we want to help you. But, but if... You don't have a reason for not being generous, then why not go ahead and go all in with Jesus? Because what we're asking is, are you ready to trust Jesus even with your money? Are you ready to increase your generosity? Now, no matter your risk level, whether you're a high stakes risk taker or whether you're a safe bet, I want to tell you about the sure thing. The sure thing. Uh, generosity is the sure thing. Some of you are going, it sounds way too risky to be generous. You're talking about, you know, giving a lot. You're talking about giving more. You don't know my finances, all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, you're right. I don't know your finances. I don't know all that kind of stuff. But here's what I know. If you will trust Jesus, it will produce a sure thing in your life. Now, here's what God actually expects of his followers. This applies to those who are followers of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, he does not expect this of you. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you know that, then God expects his followers to give him 10% of their income. That's what he expects. He says it in Scripture. It's called a tithe. And he expects us to give him the first 10% of what we make. And some of you are going, 10%, that's huge. There's no way I could do that. But I'm telling you that, that the one time in the Bible that, that God says, trust me and I'll prove it, is on this whole giving him a 10%. Malachi 3.10, you can look it up and read it. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, right before Matthew, and check it out. But there's no risk. You know what's risky? Risk is trying to bless your own life without God's help. That's risk. But if we sow generously, if we share our blessings abundantly, if we're ready to go all in, we can't lose you see, God promises to bless us in measure to our generosity. Now, let me be really clear. He doesn't give you and I the option of how we get blessed. He just tells us that he's going to bless us. In other words, we decide the measure of blessing. God decides the flavor. See, a lot of us, when we're desperate, what do we want? We want God to, to give us more money because we think more money is going to fix things. And we want God to heal us physically, right? If we're not feeling good, we're praying, God, heal me physically. And here's the thing. Those are the lowest blessings God can give you because they don't last. They only last in this world. 
And, and, you know, you can't take the money with you. You're not going to need it there anyway because you are sons and daughters of the king. In other words, you are joint heirs with Jesus, and so you own everything. It's kind of cool, isn't it? So you're not going to need any money in heaven. And here's the other thing about heaven. Um, no matter how you know, healed you get in this world, you're still going to die. You get a new body. Yay! Isn't anybody else excited about a new body? I mean, this one hurts way too much. So, um, so we get new bodies, and then there's no more suffering, sorrow, death, and pain. That stuff's all going away. So when we ask God to bless us financially or ask God to heal us physically, we're asking for temporary blessings. And God wants to bless us like crazy with things that are eternal. He wants to pour love into our lives and joy into our lives and peace into our lives. He wants to bless us with purpose and power so that we can make a difference in this world and the lives of the people that we love. He wants to bless us with relationships that are healthy and strong. Because guess what? Relationships last eternal eternity when we're in relationship with believers. So we get to determine the measure of our blessings. God determines the flavor of our blessings. So here's the challenge. Here's the question. If generosity is the safest bet, if this is the sure thing, are you ready to go all in Following Jesus. You know, the craziest thing is, God actually gives you and I the choice on whether or not we're going to get blessed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you bless us. Thank you for the way that you fill our lives with so many good things that, that they're beyond count. But this morning, we as your children uh, want to hear your voice. Speak into our lives. Teach us. Lead us. Give us the courage to take that journey into faith. Lord, already I know there's people who, who have made that decision to go all in. And, and Lord, I just pray that you'd speak encouragement and joy into their life. But Father, let us hear your voice today. And let us follow you, whether, whether we're, we're going to increase our giving or whether we're going to forgive people or whether we're going to serve you. Give us the faith to go all in for Jesus because he went all in for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's ship our God together.